All right, so we've covered the nested logit model over the last four videos. Now let's talk about some other generalized extreme value models that we'll see as kind of like uh, generalizations of that nested logit model that can get us to even more flexible uh, kind of substitution patterns and correlations among alternatives. We're not going to talk about the details of any of these, but just to give you a flavor for what's out there, should you ever need to uh, use this in your own research or encounter it in the literature. Uh, so the cumulative distribution of the nested logit model, which we looked at, I think it was in the first video this week, that's a special case of this distribution that we call the generalized extreme value distribution, or GEV. But there are actually a lot of different discrete choice models that can be, be created from that fully generalized extreme value distribution. So we already talked about the nested logit, but in this video, we're gonna just briefly cover four more, the three level nested logit, the paired combinatorial logit, the generalized nested logit, and then finally the heteroscedastic logit model. Okay, so when we talked about the nested logit model, we essentially could think about that as being a two level model. We had one model, we had one level where we had nests and then below the nests we had alternatives. But we could actually think about grouping these alternatives further into subnests. And then we'd have three levels. We'd first have some nests, then we'd have subnests, which are just finer groupings, but still not at the individual alternative level. And then finally, at the lowest level of our model, we have alternatives. And so this kind of model would yield correlations both within nests and additional correlations within those subnests inside of a nest. So just as an example here, we're gonna have in the, I'm not gonna show you the choice probabilities or anything here, but just, I think it'll help to kind of maybe see some, see some symbols instead of just talking through words. Nest K will have a Lambda parameter that defines its level of independence, just like we had with the, the more standard nested logit model. Then we're gonna have this Sigma MK which will define the level of independence within subnest M inside nest K. So one minus lambda K would give us an indicator of correlation for alternatives in the same nest, but in different subnests. Whereas one minus lambda times sigma gives us an indicator of the correlation within subnest M in nest K. So it's kind of like if things are in the same subnest, they are getting correlation for being in the same nest, plus they're getting additional correlations for being in the same subnest. And so now you can kind of have three different sets of correlations within the same subnest, within the same nest, but different subnest, and then no correlations if things are in different nests altogether. We can even think about doing more. We can do a four or five. There's no reason we have to stop at three levels for a nested logit model. Uh, but we're going to see that there are actually other GEV models that can give us more complex correlation structures and, and maybe just a simpler way than thinking about building up, you know, dozens of levels of a nested logit model. But first let's look at an example just to, 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 to kind of fix ideas on this three level idea. Suppose we have people, uh, decision makers, renters, trying to choose apartments in either Amherst or Northampton. So we could think about first saying this renter is going to think about kind of nesting apartments based on location. So we're going to have an Amherst nest and a Northampton nest. Within each of those nests, then they will think about the size of the apartment. So they're going to think about one bedroom apartments and two bedroom apartments. And so those will each be subnests inside each town. And then within each of those subnests, we have the alternatives. So here, A, for example, is an apartment. It's a one bedroom apartment in Amherst. And so that is going to be correlated with all of the other one bedroom apartments in Amherst. It's also gonna be correlated with all of the two bedroom apartments in Amherst because they're in the same nest, but they're in a different subnest. So they'll be less correlated than if they were in the same subnest. And then a one bedroom apartment in Amherst is just gonna be uncorrelated with any with any of the apartments in Northampton because they're in completely different nests. But, you know, we had to kind of formally define what the nests were. We had to say that the town was the first nest and then the apartment size was our subnest here. There's no reason that it has to be that direction. It could, it could, we could flip, flip that. It could be that renters first think about 
what size of apartment they want. Uh, if you're a, you know, a single person, there's, you might not even care about a two bedroom apartment. So, uh, so then maybe one bedroom versus two bedroom would be our nest. And then the sub nest would be the town. So once again here, apartment A is a one bedroom in Amherst and it's gonna be correlated with all other one bedroom apartments in Amherst. But now that one bedroom apartment in Amherst will also be correlated with a one bedroom apartment in Northampton, which was not the case in the, the, the nest that we had on the previous slide. It's gonna be less correlated with the apartment in Northampton than in Amherst, but it will still be correlated because they're in the same nest, even though they're in different sub nests. And then that one bedroom apartment in Amherst will be completely uncorrelated with any two bedroom apartments because they're in different nests altogether. So once again, we still kind of have to make a decision here, even though we have multi more levels, we still have to make decisions about what's a nest, what's a sub nest. Um, you know, maybe, maybe you want to allow for something where a one bedroom apartment in Amherst is correlated with both one bedroom apartments in Northampton and two bedroom apartments in Amherst. Like as long as they share some attribute, you want them to be correlated with each other. We're gonna have to do something more complicated to get to uh, a model that allows for that. So one option would be the paired combinatorial logit. Once again, I'm just gonna try to give you a brief overview of this model, but the basic idea here is that we can relax the definition of a nest to allow for overlaps so this doesn't fit kind of the traditional definition of nest that we defined when we kind of formally defined the nested logit model, because now we're gonna allow for overlaps. And we're gonna create a separate nest for every pairwise combination of alternatives. So we're gonna have J times J minus one divided by two nests with exactly two alternatives in each nest, every single pairwise combination. So that means each alternative is actually gonna appear in J minus one nests, in, in a nest with every single other alternative. And what that's gonna allow us to do is to more flexibly estimate correlations between every pair of alternatives. So we're gonna get not just like a lambda K parameter for a nest, but we can think about this as we're gonna get like a lambda IJ parameter that's going to define the level of independence between every two alternatives. The issue here is that we're gonna have a lot of parameters. We're not even gonna be able to estimate them all. So we're gonna to have to normalize at least one of them to just equal one. Um, as we have more parameters, we're just gonna have less power to identify all of them. Also, this model, once again, is only consistent with random utility or ma utility maximization if all of these parameters are in the range of zero to one. And just as we have more parameters, that's going to be less likely. So um, there, there are definitely some pros to using this kind of uh, paired combinatorial logit, but kind of suffers from the curse of dimensionality where things really explode as you have lots of alternatives. So uh, it can be a little tricky to use, even though it can give us kind of the full flexibility of a generalized extreme value model. Kind of in between case though, is, is this model called the generalized nested logit model. And this really is kind of a generalization of the nested logit model, because we're once again, again, gonna allow for some overlaps. We're gonna let an alternative be in multiple nests and to varying degrees. So we'll still construct nests one through K, but we can assign each alternative to one or more than one nests. And then what we're gonna do, we're still gonna estimate that lambda k, the independence within each nest. But for every alternative and for every nest that that alternative is in, we're also going to estimate kind of a weighting or a proportional parameter. That's going to tell us kind of how strongly is that alternative in that nest versus any of the other nests that we've assigned it to. So an example here, if we go back to our apartment choice, uh, we could think about constructing four nests. We could have an Amherst nest. We could have a Northampton nest, but we could also have a one bedroom nest and a two bedroom nest. Not, not in like a sequential ordering, but just we have four separate nests. And so then a one bedroom apartment in Amherst, we would assign it to both the Amherst nest and the one bedroom nest. We then estimate independence parameters for each of those nests but we would also estimate how strongly is that one bedroom apartment in the Amherst nest 
and how strongly is it in the one bedroom nest? So it could be that kind of like, you know, the decision maker mostly thinks about apartment size. So maybe it's like 80% in the one bedroom nest, but location does matter and not only in a sequential way. So it's like 20% in the Amherst nest or something like that. And it could allow for that to differ for different, um, for different alternatives. So it allows for kind of the model to tell us uh, kind of the structure of our nesting more so than us having to define it ourselves. But once again, we've got more parameters and we can really suffer from a curse of dimensionality here as things as we have lots of alternatives. For both the last model and this model, you can take a look at the train textbook for more details to, to, for references. And I think that the actual choice probabilities are in there for, for some of these. All right, and then the last model for this week, heteroscedastic logit. So we can actually use the, the generalized extreme value distribution to also allow for heteroscedasticity among our alternatives. And just a refresher on what heteroscedasticity means, what we're saying there is that the, the variance of that unobserved utility term, that epsilon, can be different for each alternative. So if we specify utility, just as we did in the past, but we think about the variance of any particular epsilon as depending on this theta j parameter. Remember, j is our alternative. So we're saying that the variance of epsilon is going to be different for different alternatives. Then we're going to be able to estimate these theta j parameters. Once again, we'll have to normalize one just as we often do. But we're going to then be able to estimate how the variance of the epsilon term for different alternatives compares to the, the one that we set as our reference. And so if we think that um, some of our alternatives just have kind of more stuff packed into that epsilon term and hence we'll have more variance in them, then we might want to uh, allow for that different variance for different alternatives using the heteroscedastic logit model. Uh, one tricky thing here is that these choice probabilities don't actually have a closed form expression. So we're gonna have to use simulation methods. Uh, once again, you can see the train textbook for more details on this. Um, and, and if you're uh, curious about what I mean by simulation methods, hang on, because next week we're gonna talk about the mixed logit model, which depends on simulation methods. And then in two weeks from now, we're gonna actually talk about those simulation methods themselves and how to do some simulation based uh, estimation. So that's all I've got for this week. In class, we're going to work through a, a nested logit example in R.